Father, we can hardly understand this whole process of celebrating the birth of a God who decided to put on flesh and come down and live among us. Help us to get it. Help us to understand it. Do what only you can do through the Spirit. Work your way into those hardened areas of our hearts. Break down the barriers tonight. and Let us hear the truth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. As Paul would say when he would write the letters to the church, is grace and peace uh, be unto you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, it is good to be here tonight. Good to see you. And we're so glad that each and every one of you are here to celebrate tonight the, the birth of Jesus. Uh, this is something that has been done for over 2,000 years that we get together and, and celebrate uh, Jesus' birth. However, for many, tonight is not a fun night. It's not an enjoyable night. It may not be a night of peace, as the song that we just heard. In fact, for many, Christmas is very problematic. It's not always a good night uh, because it brings back memories, uh, broken homes. Uh, the list can go on. So tonight can be a problem for many. As the little boy and the little girl sat in church and they were singing Silent Night, and the little boy got to the part where it, Silent Night, oh, holy night, sleep in heavenly beans, he says. And his sister whacked him one, and she says, no, dummy, it's heavenly peas. So, heavenly... <laughs> for some, it's very problematic. And for some, it's an overjoyed evening. I did a little survey the last month on that issue. Talking to different people as we get to this point, uh, learning about different things. And how problematic is this? Because in reality, Scripture says, tonight we, great, we get to hear good news. And how, how many people actually absorb good news? How many people actually say that Jesus' birth is good news? So for the last month, I've been doing my own little survey and asking people, uh, you know, different questions about Christmas. And everybody has different views and different things that go on in their life, and you know what? For many, it is a very bumpy day, and tomorrow, a very busy day. Ginger and I got married in 1982. No kids there for first three years. You know, Christmas was, was pretty calm. I celebrated Christmas, Christmas Eve in our church tradition. We would eat oyster stew at 5 p.m. If you like oyster stew, you can say amen. <laughs> wow, hey, I love you guys. Uh, many people don't like that soup, but... So we would do that at 5 o'clock. We would go to church. We would do our little parts in the church service, and it was all about the kids' program and the church I went to. And we wore our little gowns and our red capes, and, and we had a wonderful time, and we would come home and open our presents. And that was our Christmas Eve. Well, I met this beautiful brunette here, and we got married. And God bless the, the two families. We only were about 10 miles apart. They celebrated church at a midnight service, and then they opened their presents and celebrated the family a tradition on, sun, on Christmas Day morning. Hey, that worked out great because we could do ours and then we could do hers. Well, in 1985, our oldest daughter came along and now you have children into the mix and, you know, you don't want to keep them up too late and, well, we got to go to my parents and we got to go to your parents and pretty soon you have another child and then we moved 40 miles away and then we got to go here. Oh, remember Grandma? We got to go to Grandma's house in there and pretty soon it just all starts to stack up and it gets to be a mess it can become very problematic. And in the 21st century, now throw in a divorce on one or the other side. You know, now you've got a two families over here and a couple more grandmas and grandpas or maybe even two divorces, which is very common in today's world. And, you know, you, you want to do this thing and you got all these people and, ah, oh, Christmas no longer is full of joy. And so my, my little survey was this, that how many of you as spouses, men and women alike, I'm not picking on women here, but initially the survey was for women, but I did both to keep it equal time. How many of you ever have lied to your spouse about Christmas? You don't have to raise your hands. We'll have a time of repentance at the end of the message. <laughs> People lie at Christmas time. Did you know that? You know, and I, my, my survey was 22 people and 13 couples, but it was 50-50. Only 50% of them had ever lied to their spouse. Meaning, honey, what do... Okay, I'll do the guy thing with the gals first. But, honey, what would you like for Christmas? You don't have to get me anything. You know, I just want to be with you. 
you know, a little mistletoe, it'll all be fine. Sunday morning comes, they're, they're going to open the presents, and there's no present from the husband to the wife. Woe to you, evil husband! You know, yeah, it is. And it worked both ways. Guys said, well, yeah, you know what, sometimes I've told her I don't want anything, but did you really not want anything? Well, yeah, I still like something. So, very problematic. We can get a very distorted view of this whole thing as is what I'm sharing with you there. I pray that's not the case because the Bible says tonight we get to hear the good news. We get to share the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has good news. And listen, if it's good news, it should bring joy. It should bring peace. It should bring happiness. And if some of you are sitting here tonight and, and this celebration, especially in a church setting, has, has not been good, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize to you. Uh, because churches have a tendency to not deliver good news sometimes. Uh, where have you been for a year? You haven't been in church. You, you didn't give very much last year. You know, and the list can go on, and all of a sudden you're sitting in church. What's so good news about that? Uh, I'm sorry if that's happened to you, but if it has happened to you and you're here tonight, praise God, because we're going to hear the good news. Good news is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And in that story, when the angels say, I bring good news, it's actually, I'm bringing you a new story. Gospel means good news, but the good news means a new story. So we have a new story to talk about tonight. Uh, and it's, it's good. It's good. And I know some of you also, maybe somebody listening to this, you know, maybe Christmas was a time when Dad came home drunk and there was abuse. Uh, maybe Christmas was a time when mom left because of the abuse and you didn't have anywhere to go and you went to grandma's house. So I want to reassure you tonight that you're here, God is God, and he is love. And the message is good news. Very familiar text, a couple of them here. We'll get into this message. Luke 2, 10 through 11, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you what? Good news of great joy that will be there for all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David, Christ the Lord. I'm going in a little bit different direction tonight. I'm going to talk about the most famous verse in all of the Bible, John 3, 16 and 17, because that verse encapsulates the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, hallelujah, but have eternal life. Is that good news? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John was a disciple of Jesus. He walked and talked and, and lived next to him for over three and a half years. He, you know, it, it gives me chills to think about that. That the words that we read came from an individual who probably held his hand and, and walked with him and was taught by him. And John gets into later years of his life and he begins to realize that this good news needs to be documented. And he writes the Gospel of John. He writes the Gospel of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But John is the only disciple that survived this whole disciple thing as an eyewitness, and he, didn't, he, he wasn't martyred. He wasn't killed. John actually died of natural causes. We figure he was close to 100 years old, which is amazing because in Jesus' time there was no health care. There wasn't antibiotics, penicillin, or Tamiflu, or whatever it was. So to get to that age was a miracle in itself. And John gets to this point, and he writes this gospel, and he gets to this story about Nicodemus. And, and I, I can just imagine him sitting there thinking through how this all unfolded, and he wanted to get God's feelings and his words onto paper so people could hear this good news. And he, he gets to this story about this man named, named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus seeks John or seeks Jesus out at night, and he said, What must I do to be saved? And Jesus tells Nick, He says, Listen, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. See is the favorite verb for me in all the New Testament. It simply means to see with an understanding. In other words, Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, unless you know who I am, unless you understand who I am, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. And he ends this discourse with John 3.16. 
And he wraps this whole thing up, and I just imagine John sitting there, how would Jesus, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, want this to be heard? And this is what he says. Yahweh loved. And if you don't hear anything else tonight, you are loved. This, this God that came down and became human loved. Not only did he love, he puts this little word in there, so loved. He just didn't look at you and think, oh, you're an awesome person. I, I love you. No, he looked at you and he said, I so love you. I so love Ginger. When you add that little two-letter two preposition in there, it gives it that punch. He said, I so loved. How so loved the world? That's you and I. How much did he love it that he gave? That's part of the, most of the emphasis in the good news, that we give. A church has something to give, that he gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave us his son. Now, that's not that big a deal, right? I mean, here, world, have my son. But whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's the thrust of it. So John was able, through the work of the Holy Spirit, he, he puts this into context. And listen, if, if you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, you know what, I, this whole Christian thing really isn't for me, that's okay. Because sooner or later you're going to have to deal with this being a Christian and understand God so loved the world. But my goal tonight is that if you're saying it's not for me, I want you to know what you're missing out on. That this God that so loved the world, that involved you. And that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you never decide to become a Christian, at least you heard what you're missing out on. John put a key word into this verse that many people miss. It's a simple two-little word in Greek. It, it, it's in. And before I get to in i got to explain something to you, because for God so loved the world, Paul's writing in a Roman Greek culture, all right? If you study Greek mythology, the gods played and the people paid is literally what went on. So in Greek mythology, there was no God in Greek mythology that said, I, God, am going to give you my son, and I'm going to sacrifice my son. It would have never happened in Greek mythology. Greek mythology, the Greek gods played and you paid. If you, if you were not able to conceive a child, it was because the gods were angry with you. If you had a poor crop year, the gods were angry with you. It, it was all tied up into this mythology. And all of a sudden, here comes a god that says, I love you, and I'm going to give you my son, and he's going to die for you. It made no sense to them. So John said, how do I get this message across? And it fails in English, but when it says whoever, that's whoever, Greeks, Romans, black, white, Hispanic, everybody is whoever believes in him. Now here's the tension. In English, it says in, I-N. In Greek, in is E-N, in. In is in. If you understand that, you can say amen. I think it's going to get pretty deep here, so hang on. So in is in. But John didn't use in. John used ace. See, we miss this in English because he, he didn't want it to just to believe in God. He said, I, I want it to be ace. I want it to believe, to, to have a relationship with God, to believe into God. And we miss that preposition in the English, but that's how he worded it. Let me demonstrate it for you, real, really simple. If this hypothetical is Jesus. I can believe in Jesus. Right? That, that's how that reads, to believe in Jesus. I, I can believe in this. I, I can believe in Jesus, and I can be here. This is static. There's, there, there's no movement here. Okay? So, Jesus is cool. Jesus is good. I can learn about him. I can go to Christmas Eve services. Whoa, peace on earth. These guys sing amazing song. Oh, Jesus is so good. I can believe in him. But am I trusting him? Do I have a relationship with him? That's the difference in this two little word here. John says, no, it's more than believing in him. 
And so many people in our culture today say, I know about Jesus. I know all about Jesus. I understand he came and he died for me. And, and the whole time, it's, it's like this. There's Jesus. You know, hey, he's cool. Believing in him. This little preposition that John adds to it is into means this, that I'm going to put everything I have, all my trust, all my faith, everything I have into him. So literally what John is saying, and this is a poor illustration and all of them break down, but it's the best we can do, is did it hold me up? Am I sitting on it? I'm believing into him now. So ace means that whoever believes trusts. The faith is as such that this is my God. And now I'm in a fluid relationship. Now God can move and I can go and we have become one and, and we flow together. I'm not looking at it and believing in it. I'm believing into it. See the difference? And John wanted us to get that. I, I struggled with this, and I thought, well, there's got to be some more ways, so i got a, a glass of water. Same illustration. Okay, so this is God, Jesus the Christ, in the water, and water is what in three parts? Water, ice, and steam. So if I'm the ice cubes, and I believe into Jesus... I'm, I become one with him. Eventually these ice cubes will melt and you can't tell where the beginning is and where the end is. It's all one. But I could hold the ice in my hand and if the ice would never melt, I would believe in him, but I would never be part of him. It's a huge difference. So John says when you believe into Jesus, when you lean into him, and the faith structure is as such, it's not your faith, but it's his faith, and I trust it, now you get to live a life that you will never perish. That's, that's like uncomprehensible. But perish means that, guess what? You're going to die. Right? Anybody believe they're going to die? Yeah, but perish means you're never going to die. Yes, the physical part of Pastor Lynn that you can see here tonight will pass away. But my spirit will never die. And that's what he says. When you believe into Jesus, you shall not, no, not ever, is how it reads, perish. Perish means die, but Allah. You didn't know you were going to come to a Christmas Eve service and have a Greek lesson, but Allah is the heavy but. It's the big but. He says when you believe into Jesus, you will not die. You will, no, not ever perish, but you will have eternal life. Eternal life never ends. When you believe into Jesus the Christ. What is eternal life? It's a relationship with God the Father. God loved, God gave, Jesus loved, Jesus gave, you believe, you receive. When you believe into him. And you get to have eternal life. Jesus wanted to give the fallen world back the relationship that was lost in the garden to everybody, whoever believes into him. Is that good news? Yeah, that's good news. That's why we celebrate the birth of Jesus, because here a God decided to put on flesh and do this for us. To believe into, not about, not walking around it. So if you've ever felt condemned as a Christian, if, if you've ever been in a fellowship that, that has said, you know what, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. You got, it gave you all these rules and regulations. If you've ever been in, in some sort of a situation where the, it's condemnation, I'm here tonight to tell you the good news. Right in the next verse, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it, to believe into. And I'll say it again, if you are one of those individuals, I'm sorry. Because Jesus the Christ brought good news. And what this is, this is a static, you can say you know about him, but until you believe into him that salvation happens, this is a movement from dark to light. And when you're in the light, there's light, there's movement, there's fluidity. Through him, 
the world might be saved. It's a hard thing to grasp. Ginger and I have two girls. I live in those girls. Ginger lives in those girls. If you have kids, part of you is in those kids. God loved, God gave, Jesus loved, Jesus gave. You believe, you receive, when you receive him, part of God lives in you. Isn't that cool? I mean, when we trust him, we receive this pure relationship that God wanted for his children. So the angel announced to the shepherds, he says, I bring you good news. That you bring peace on earth and joy to all men. And if you're trusting yourself tonight, if you walked into this church service and you can honestly say, I'm I'm here. Let, Let me just give you a little insight of here. You're trusting yourself. You're trusting that everything you can do here is going to work to save you. It's only when you trust into him that you have peace, that you have security, that you have hope. And you will never know where you stand for sure until you take that leap of faith and trust in to Jesus. Jesus says, I take away all the fear. I take away all the condemnation. John looked at him and he said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's good news. How do you receive that? You simply put your faith and trust in him. I'll say it one more time because that's where we're at. God loved, God gave. Jesus loved, Jesus gave. You believe it, you receive it. That's the good news. I came here tonight to share that with you. And I pray that if you're sitting here and and you've never heard of anything like it, right where you're at right now, We're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray. And if you've never heard the good news, tonight is the night to say, I want to receive that John 3.16. I want to leave here with the assurance today that I can can take this. I can take that step of faith. I can trust in my Jesus. And I'll never have to worry again. That's why God came. That's why he gave us his son, Jesus. That's what we're celebrating tonight. I hope you go home and tear open packages and love on your kids and your family and share the good news. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and pray. Father, you are amazing. You are a God who wants to give. And you did, you gave your son. Father, I pray for the individuals who are here tonight or those who are listening that Christmas has not been about good news. It's a time of year that's been bumpy, sideways, maybe even angry. We've got to go here, we've got to go there. So I pray for the individuals and, and all of us here. We say thank you, Jesus, for giving us your life. We say thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. And if you've never trusted in him, all you have to say tonight is, I want to receive you, Jesus. It's been a lonely road. It's been a bumpy path. But tonight you can sit back. Put the faith and the trust into a God who will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never condemn you. He will just remind you that your sins are washed away. And you get to live a life knowing full well that you will never perish Spend eternity with the good news. Father, I thank you for what you've done here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. In the good and strong name of Jesus. Jesus. The name that's above all names. Jesus. We thank you, Jesus.